housekeeping. Um, I would love to extend a warm welcome on behalf of the Harris Center to everyone. Those of you who might be new to us, the Harris Center is a nonprofit organization based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire, where we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and environmental education. Um, if you're local to us, I always like to share that we've protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development. Much of that is open for hiking or birding or other recreation and enjoyment. Um, coordinate conservation, conservation research on our protected lands and throughout the region. And at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages from babies in backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. Um, we offer more than 150 programs a year for the public including hikes and birding outings and paddles and Zooms like this one. Now it's really my honor and um, delight to present tonight's speaker, the person we're all here to learn from, Sherry Gould. She's an enrolled tribal member in the Nulhegan Band of Koasuk Abenaki Nation, as well as the tribal genealogist and a lifelong resident of New Hampshire. She lives in Warner, where she serves as co-director of the Abenaki Trails Project, which she's gonna share with us tonight. She's also a Western Abenaki master basket maker and was the first Native American to be juried by the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. She passes on the art of making baskets by teaching apprentices and performing demonstrations throughout the region. And we are just so excited to, to welcome her and to learn from her tonight. So with that, welcome Sherry and the stage is yours. Leonie, Kwai Ni Domba, in Delawizi, Sali Gould, in Daing Manadnock, in Wikiak, Massasecum, Nodzia Basno Dakad. I said, Welcome, friends. My name is Sherry Gould. I was born in Peterborough. I live in a little section of Warner near Lake Massasecum, and I am a professional basket maker. So you didn't hear anything much of anything new there, but you did hear it in Abenaki. What we're looking at here is the confluence of the Warner and Kentuckuk River. And uh, I just have to say that this picture was done by drone. The little tiny specks you see down here in the water, that was us uh, taking our first paddle down the Kentuckuk and on the Warner. And um, we saw the drone and we were totally mystified. And it was clearly over us, staying with us was the government like, what? <laughs> and so it was Bob Lepree, the former head photographer for the Manchester Union leader, who just saw what we were doing, heard about what we were doing and surprised us and brought his drone down and took this picture and provided it for our use uh, in the project. But it's a, a fun way to, um, to talk about what we're doing here. Okay, I've got to do one more technical thing and that's move my bar. Okay, whoops, I think that'll work. Okay, so um, I'm gonna start by talking really briefly and I'm gonna go really fast through this and people, uh, you know, if you have questions about any of it, we can talk more about that in the question and answer, but I wanna make sure we have time for the questions and answers. So the project started in July of 2020. Daryl Peasley, seen here, decided he wanted to, um, he wanted to do a project that would uh, show once and for all that we were here. We always hear, oh, New Hampshire was just a pass-through state. No Abenaki ever lived here. So we don't hear that so much anymore, but um, I think we have a little part to play in that. <laughs> and also just people, um, people's awakening and what have you. So, um, so Daryl came to Bill and I and he said, I really wanna do this project. And we're like, okay. Um, and he, we decided we were going to start with Kentuckuk the, or Hopkinton, the town he lives in. And we decided in terms of, we're going to focus a lot in this talk on the methodology of what we've done. So we decided that now it was August of 2020. You, some of you may recall that was a time of upheaval when uh, statues were getting torn down around the country and what have you. So we made a conscious choice to first meet with the selectmen and to let them know who we were, that we were the Nalhegan Band and that we were here, uh, we live here, but we just were studying sites that we knew about and told them a little bit about what we were doing. And at the end, asked them if there was anything specific they wanted us to do. So it started with Henniker. And you'll see this photo is by Carol Lake. She's an artist who has 
very generously offered to do um, a bas relief pla plaque for us. And so this is the, the theme of that plaque is gonna be the old one inspiring modern Abenaki. I get to play the old one. <laughs> Daryl liked that, he got to play the young one. <laughs> So uh, the first thing we did was to identify sites and Daryl knew about this place, Indian Chimney. And so he got uh, Dr. Bob Goodby to go out with him and some other folks to look at that site. And, you know, is it Indian or isn't it? I mean, and, and the thing that Daryl and I have learned in this project is when you live here and people know your neighbors know your, your Abenaki or your Native American, everybody comes to you with these stories and we thought everybody knew all these stories and it's been an eye-opener for us that not everybody you know some people know one some people know another but at any rate this was one of the stories the the big mystery around the Indian chimney in Hopkinton and so um, they checked that out but it quickly became apparent that from Indian chimney where at Joe Sylvia Lake where the dugout canoe was found that's in the Hopkinton Historical Society and then you're right into Davisville, which goes into Warner. So that site crept right into Warner. And then there was another site in West Hopkinton and that quickly crept over the border into to Hanneker. And at that point we're like, oh my goodness, our ancestors didn't draw little boxes on maps and live in them. They lived on the land where it made sense. So we can't really look at things. Political boundaries are kind of nonsensical to the way uh, I think all native people, but certainly Abenaki people lived. So um, once we were at Warner, Hopkinton and Hanneker, it only made sense to add Bradford. That we knew there was some really cool places in Bradford to explore. So after identifying the sites, um, the next step, you know, the other part that Daryl really wanted people to know, and we all agreed, is we're still here and that people would see a, a vibrant modern presence. So um, this is, happens to be a picture at History Alive in Hillsboro. Hi, Marianne. <laughs> I'm going to talk about you a couple of times. Here's one of them. But um, so last summer we participated there. Several initiatives have come out of this uh, project. So you see um, Reed and my husband Bill started making birch bark canoes. <clears throat> Excuse me. That, <laughs> that got so popular on Facebook. They blocked Bill. Poor Bill. <laughs> an old Indian logger and he got blocked on Facebook. He had to prove he was a real person. We live in a dead cell zone. He had to do double authentication. You don't have a cell phone. It was quite a nightmare, but at any rate, he's finally back able to, um... anyway, I don't want to waste a lot of time on that. So here we are. This is kind of our family band. We've been here for you know, a long time, interrelated families. We've lived, our families have lived at least the last century in the Monadnock to Lake Sunapee to Hopkinton area. And that's kind of the triangle we're focusing on as we've expanded from um, the four towns. Last year we added on, in 21 we added on um, Hillsboro and Washington. And then this fall we'll be adding Newbury and Sunapee, and we're just going to keep adding the towns in the area until we cover, we hope we live long enough to cover this area. And we hope we can uh, record enough of this process to so people can replicate it. But at any rate, this is my mom. Uh, Vicki started doing, my cousin Vicki does pottery. She's a modern potterer. So she branched into Abenaki pottery from seeing the um, the shards from the museums, from our collaborative work in the area. Daryl started a food pantry. We have a really big food waste program going. And um, so that's just a few of the offshoots that have come from the project. So we did some public treks and I'm just gonna really briefly go over a couple of them. Another site that we knew uh, about was the steps in Henniker. And so we learned where they were through the Henniker Historical Society and um, we invited the public to come. The public loves coming on our treks with us. So here you can't see him. He's hiding. Dr. Goodby is the blue jacket and hand <laughs> behind the people behind that tree. And, um, and so we just really, you know, and then we had a lot of people, Hanneker Historical Society, Hopkinton Historical Society, friends, the public, um, a lot of folks were here. And uh, this, this particular site also involved 
uh, New, Eng New England College because a professor there had studied these footprints and we're still in search of the file of the information he gathered on them. But um, I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail on that particular thing, but I just, again, focusing on the process. So as we're working with our community members um, and the historical societies, Warner Historical Society started digging through their records. And this is an example of a newspaper clipping they had, a, a Warner resident who had moved to Henniker, and she's writing home and she says, did you know that in the road on what, and she talks about the location, there's a human print. And, um, and so it's kind of buried by the road, but our human footprints in granite, very common. I've never seen but two and they're in a pasture in Henniker. So we had this clue to perhaps another footprint. And I can say that Rebecca Corser and the town, the road agent in Warner are still working on seeing if they can locate that one. But in the meantime, in um, the Hopkinton Historical Society, they found a notation about this footprint and, oops, I'm still getting used to Prezi, I love it, but it's, so this little footprint and a couple of girls had discovered it many, many years ago. Someone did find it and take a Polaroid and made a notation of the map it could be found on. They dug out the old maps to find out where those properties were. A group of us went and we were trekking all over these two lots um, on this old road. And we were finally giving up, we weren't gonna find it. And as we were about to leave, right on the edge of the road. This is the dirt on the side of the road between the tar pavement and this rock. We barely could see this little thing started. <laughs> we didn't even have tools, but we, we used the windshield brush. <laughs> Somebody had a snow brush in their car and um, cleaned it up, put some water on it. As you can see, it's much smaller than a human foot. And there's another mark here. We determined this one is uh, a myth. It's not an Indian footprint. It is probably the mark of a, a big shovel moving the rock during a road project. So that's kind of the methodology. We're just looking at, we're gonna go into a couple of projects in much more depth, but um, that's one of them. And another quick look at a second uh, site is Lake Massasecum. So uh, Massasecum, I always thought was probably a myth. The, it translates to big chief, white people calling a guy big chief. There was a big chief and, and the story um, has that very colonial type tone that uh, he was the last, no, the Penacook people rejected him because he was friendly to the whites. And so he had to live here in isolation all by himself. So that part, uh, I definitely didn't believe and I didn't believe the big chief part. Anyway, again, I'm, I don't wanna, uh, bog us down in the details here, but this dugout canoe had been found in the lake. My mom grew up in Bradford and swears my grandfather had a part in finding it, but at any rate, uh, it disappeared shortly after, but this postcard was created. So we knew that a dugout had come out of Lake Massasecum. We decided we would uh, invite a group of people to come and we would do a, a paddle on the lake. Whoops. Sorry about that, um, which we did. And we all embarked onto Lake Massasecum. Um, we had a host arriving when church got out and you'll see him later, but we, we wanted to start out earlier at 10. So uh, I made photocopies of the picture and we made it a scavenger hunt. And we all, the goal was we were paddling across the lake to the other side. There's a big island, a couple of them, but we would go by a big island to get to the other side of the lake and hope we could check out the shoreline, which we knew would have changed since the 1930s time period, but uh, just to have fun and, and see if we could guess where it was before Harry came. Well, we had fun and we had a bit of a surprise because as we passed the island, this guy came swooping down, this eagle, and uh, he swooped around us. He, we talked to him a little, and then he flew along and went down the lake and landed in this tree. So we very respectfully followed him. And when we got down there, um, he, he was right here in these trees. So as we looked at the lands, the shoreline, this new wall had been built. So that clearly had changed the shoreline, but um, it looked like it was probably where 
where the canoe would have been. And behind me here is Seacombs Rock. And so we told the story. And in the meantime, we had found a lot of details that I won't go into at great length now, but uh, it, it made it clear that the story about Massa Seacomb, he was a real person. We are convinced, all of us, um, both the tribe and the, well, the local people were always convinced, <laughs> but the tribal people now are in agreement that there was a, a real person there. And so um, after somebody said, whoever arranged the tour, meaning the eagle, great job. <laughs> we uh, headed back over and Harry was back. He met us on his beach and confirmed that that is exactly where the uh, dugout was found. So that was a little cool and strange that the, that the eagle came out and took us there, but he did. And then um, a neighbor who's a friend of mine, his dad had found these two artifacts of the lake throughout the years and he brought them over so that Harry could show them to us. Harry's an active member of the Historical Society and also a former selectman and lives right there on the lake and did a lot of research in the Historical Society about the story, found old diary entries about uh, when the lake was named. So, you know, just again, looking at the myth methodology, you see that when the whole community comes together and people dig into the histories and we have tribal information uh, that you put it all together and and it really helps to bring out a much a much more complete story. So now we're going to dig down to a couple of sites. Oh, nope. We're going to look at public events really quick. So then there were all kinds of public events popping up. So when we very first got started, we had um, the two the two villages art gallery said we want to do an art show on Abenaki art which was so cool and um so Abenaki people emerging from the ashes happened that first May after we started and so last May and it was very very successful uh New England College funded the costs that the art gallery would normally ex expect to cover from the proceeds and instead the proceeds came back to the project and the Vermont Abenaki Artists Association. So, and we invited uh, some of our community partners because as we're doing this, Anne Eldridge, who's the head of the Bradford Conservation Commission is a juried artist. A lot of us were juried artists. All of a sudden we realized it was a lot of arts people as well as conservation people. And so our partners kind of art blended really beautifully with ours and it was, it was just really successful. And then there were a couple of other events um, I was gonna share. Oh, one is of course, History Alive. So um, that was a really great project. Again, you see Bill's canoe and Reed's canoes, Vicky's pottery, some of my baskets, and we had a great time and we're doing it again this summer. We'll talk about that time frame a little more. And then we did the first Indigenous People's Day event at Mount Curiosaw Indian Museum, and they've been an incredible partner. Um, here you see me putting my foot in those footprints that we talked about um, briefly. It fits, so uh, I have some friends who are loving to joke with me about the Indian Cinderella, whose <laughs> instead of a shoe, my foot fit in the footprint. At any rate, uh, and I wanted to point out here, and she's with us, so, but it was part of my plan anyway. You'll see Marianne Baker, who, um, did spoke was one of the speakers and talked about some friends actions that were happening and that's going to become important later on in the story. Chief Don came down we had um, the Warner and Hopkinton select persons were there or I guess they like to be called selectmen either way at any rate um, they were telling what both towns had done they had both changed to Indigenous People's Day and uh, and, and it was a great time. So that's kind of a big overview of how things have um, gone with the project. Now we're gonna dig a little deeper. So um, Bradford Springs was pretty exciting. And when we met with the Bradford Selectmen and we said, is there anything you want us to do? <clears throat> Excuse me, I had mentioned, you know, sites I knew in Bradford, Lake Massasecum and Bradford Springs. So just in general, you know that or certainly anywhere I've been, uh, Saratoga Springs, any of those places where there were big bathhouses and Victorian kinds of things, there was 
a, a deep native history behind it. So I was pretty sure there was a deep native history behind Bradford Springs, but I only had ever heard about it. I had never been to it and I just wanted to explore it. And then when we said, is there anything you want us to do? I hope you do something with Bradford Springs. And I'm thinking, what would we do with it? Like, I just want to see it <laughs> and get more of the history and the story. You'll see it, it grew. So we started by exploring the site like we do all places. And it's, it was just in the middle of the bog. Thank God in 2020, we had the drought. So we were able to hike out there, but, or we did a lot of falling on tussocks and, um, and poor Harry that I introduced you to earlier fell in a, a beaver dam thing. And we, he didn't come out again with us. <laughs> he will probably in the end when we get it fixed up, but there was this old wellhead and it's broken. And um, we had no idea the well is starting to chip away in the corner here. We had no idea, we still don't for sure, the quality of the water that's in it. Um, we brought a well expert out. We've just had so many incredibly wonderful people volunteer to help out. Stone Water Company out of Vermont volunteered to come down and um, help us you know, decide what we needed to do to get on top of the water quality. And then, um, these two women who are students were students in in the uh, master's program for the Harvard School of Design volunteered to do um, a design for us a landscape design for their final project whoops and to um, help us you know we didn't we weren't sure where we were going to do uh, use their services but um, you'll see in a minute where we did so then the other part of this is, is the Atlantic White Cedar Bog that's um, adjacent to this. And the town of Bradford owned both of these properties and they're under easement with the Osborne S Sergeant Land Trust. So um, the Atlantic White Cedar has been heavily hit in this country. They estimate that there's 5% of the Atlantic White Cedar left that was here at the time of contact. And most of that is right on the coast. And so it's um, it's serious risk of the sea level rise. And there are a few inland ones. This is one of the more no Northern inland ones. So Bill, my husband, Bill got really active in being concerned because um, an, uh, a neighbor to that land, a landowner who abuts the town owned, so part of the bog, had let them cut a tree down and that canoe you saw the picture of, those ribs came from a tree from the site. And it's a material that we would use. It means a lot to us. And coming from this site of our medicine water, it was really important. So um, the Nature Conservancy, the Osborne Sargent Land Trust, the Bradford Conservation Commission, and then all were touring this site. And the Nature Conservancy has another one of these in Antrim. <clears throat> excuse me, we looked at that one. And then um, for the last meeting, we invited UNH and Heidi Osbornson just had gotten a big grant that Jean Shaheen had announced about looking at climate change and the impact on the forest. So we, we invited her to come, she brought a team and we just got word that, um, I, I, wait a minute, I can't give that away yet. And so she came and she listened and we talked and it was wonderful. So that was all part of the exploration. Then we had to do a lot of planning. So um, we really wanted to ensure that tribal members, not just us, but Abenaki people, you know, our grandchildren and forever would have um, access to the medicine plants and the cultural materials and the food on public lands. And so um, we were looking at a conservation easement and we were working with the Con Bradford Conservation Commission. The town was very supportive. We worked with Osborne Sargent Land Trust and they were supportive. The issue came up that, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that it really you have to go back to court and you have to open up the whole easement with a judge and that's costly and it's risky in terms of who's going to want to change what. And so, uh, yeah, so we agreed to do a memorandum of understanding and that's almost completed, but that's what we negotiated. Uh, you're gonna see the design plan that the ladies came up with. It was extensive, it was incredible. As tribal members, we watched it at the same time that we invited the community partners. We were in tears 
uh, or some of us, I was, and, um, and our community members were just jaw dropping in awe. Um, we'd love to implement all of it, but not at that site for lots of different reasons. Um, so we, we'll, we'll, we'll be scaling back the design. And then uh, we had to explore grants in order to do the things we wanted to do there. And uh, I already talked about what we did with the bug. So um, let's take a look real quick. So this is a video of an Occupy um, Trails project. And that's on YouTube. And you can see the name up here, Bradford Spring Public Design Reveal. And if you search YouTube, you can watch the whole uh, video anytime. We're only going to do bits and pieces of it here for time's sake. But um, Conchin and Polly were the two students from the, the Harvard School of Design that had offered to do this for us. And this is their reveal. And I'll be playing you bits and pieces of it. Okay, there it is. We just wanted to start by walking through our process of how we translated the mission of the project into the design. And we're gonna provide some general context that we know many of you are already familiar with, but it seems like we also have some newcomers in the room. So we're gonna begin by actually reading the uh, Abenaki Trails Project mission statement. So we can just kind of take a moment to reflect on why we're all here. The goal of this project is to visibly honor and share a more inclusive history of the Abenaki people to highlight historical Abenaki sites and to accentuate the positive influence we've had with colonial America and the towns we continue to live in today. It is our hope that this project will help educate the general public and share a cultural exchange with the Abenaki people, past and present. The Nilhigan Band of the Kusuk Abenaki Nation welcomes you on our journey together. And so uh, I'm gonna skip above, they kind of go through some of the, um the sad things that are real and important, and I'm not skipping them because they don't matter, but uh, just for time's sake. Generous and inspiring spirit of the project that both tribal members and so many enthusiastic non-native community members have come together to change how the complex history between Abenaki people and colonial America can be told. So the project has eight. So here they're just talking about like the scope of the sites, but we're gonna focus here on Bradford Springs. But the Bradford Springs site is really unique within the project because of this incredible opportunity for the Abenaki tribe to partner with the Osborne Sargent Land Trust and the Bradford Conservation Commission in negotiating a tribal easement in concert with the existing conservation easement. And on this map, you can see the location of the Bradford Springs in the lower left corner of the town of Bradford. And for a little more orientation, uh, we see here this forest and wetland site, which is in a really beautiful and remote area about 30 minutes to town. And it's a wetland which includes a mineral spring that was a sacred place of healing for generations to Abenaki people. It also holds an important place in local history as the Bradford Springs Hotel and other buildings existed here from around 1840 to 1921. And it neighbors a rare habitat of the North Atlantic cedar bog, also under the same conservation easement. So the tribal conservation easement marks renewed access to the mineral water for the tribe after an almost 200 year lapse. And this unique opportunity of designing for renewed access through a focus on sharing Abenaki presence with the broader local community is how Conchin and I have become involved in the project. So here you can see us um, on site. So she talks a little bit about, again, exploring. They got to come up and explore with us. She talks about the footprints. Terry, you're just a little bit behind where you wanted to be time-wise, just so you know. Thank about you. The halfway through. The ancestors mark the way forward and are held by the double curve motif curls. Um, and so in the way that we, we made that diagram to help us kind of have a better sense, a deep sense of what the project is about, um, we did a story, story sharing event with the core tribal members, as well as um, Chief Don Stevens. Um, and in that event, we started with prompts about tribal and family histories and experiences with water and healing. Um, it was a really fun and wonderful half hour, at least. And it was fun and wonderful, but just to give you an idea. So from that, they came up with these design elements, which you see in the bottom right here. And um, 
Learning about all of that led us to uh, kind of create this set of guiding values translated into design language. And again, rather than spend time there. Um, so also they came up, so what they came up with, and you see it here on the site, is this quarter mile walk. We're not gonna do that extensive walk as much as we thought, uh, whatever. Um, yeah, we're just not gonna do that much. So I'll show you where um, we are with the arrow when I let this start playing again. For distinct yet connected experiences, tell a story of gathering at the entrance, the Abenaki creation story, the story Whoops. of the spirit of the woods, and the story of medicine water. <laughs> um, these are the stories that through our conversations with tribal members came forward as being Again, um, so we, we looked at a pavilion, you saw the history, and these are parts of it that we're going to skip through because we're not including that. There's a couple of spots here, yeah, right here, that are, I think, important. The site-wide signage, that the narrative signs, like the ones that you saw in that first drawing of the entrance, could be made um, through a printed pressure laminated panel um, that would be mounted on a local timber post. Um, and then throughout the site, partially milled posts um, would share plant identification, really similar to the how the plant ID um, happens currently at the Bradford Bog site, which is next door. But here, signs could be inscribed with both Abenaki and English names. So there's that part. And then um, these are also parts we're not including our creation story, which includes we were created from the ash tree, of course, and then making baskets. And um, the ash borer is destroying them all. And it really forced, I will say, it forced Bill and I to come to grips with that fact that we had kind of been pushing away and thinking, oh, that won't happen here. <laughs> so it's uh, caused us to do some things differently. But um, wait a minute. Oh, no, we're going to get into that. OK, so we get to this we are doing. So now we come to the springs. Um, in Abenaki, Nebi means water um, and is the root of Nebi zone, medicine, water, medicine, and life. The mineral waters of this place um, sustained and healed the plants, animals, and people for thousands of years. Um, and here in this plan, you can see the uh, quarter mile boardwalk loop um, with the small observation. So I'll go past all that. She talks about, um, you know, just as you walk through the the swamp or the bog how encompassing it is she talks about how so that the design is to put a, a wigwam platform, style frame. create a space that could be really enjoyable for someone visiting alone um, but also provide space for group gatherings and for ceremonies so the the boardwalk and the platform um, strongly mark Abenaki's centering of water <laughs> And we do intend to implement this. This is the part I did really want to share. So um, make here it's talking about using Abenaki words for the plant names right on the boards of the walkway. Oh, tamarac or another species. Uh, as you see there. And the this particularly. Board walk can be constructed us. using metal helical piles, um, which have demonstrable success in low impact boardwalk design. Um, because they allow for undisturbed perennial water flows and um, beaver habitat. Helical piles are also great because they can be installed by hand um, without the use of heavy machinery that could potentially damage the marsh. Um, also, the consistent curve radius of the board. Yeah, that's not so important. So, access to the water with. As you can see, we have a rich, and we do plan on looking at some um at, at implementing pieces of that at other sites so <clears throat> in terms of the final plan we came to an agreement we'll do the mou with osborne sergeant the bradford uh we applied for a grant to fund the work through the national trust for historic preservation it was actually the town of bradford applying they opened the portal they let the tribe write the grant just really a nice partnership uh equal partners in that project and the site plan was scaled back, as I said. And if I can move this silly bar there. And UNH came up with, oh my gosh, this incredible research project and a grant to allow one of our tribal members. And we actually had a tribal member who was working on his master's program. And um, he's looking at 
coming to UNH to do to complete his master's in forestry and be funded to do the research on the health of the the cedar forest. So um, I'm landing white cedar there. We're pretty excited about that. Okay, uh, Indian tie-up. I'm going to go really quick through this because it's really fun and exciting. And this is where Marianne Baker comes in again. There's a place not far from my house called Indian tie-up, another place like, what do you think about Indian tie-up? The myth is that the Abenaki summered at Lake Massasecum, and then they climbed up 1,300 feet into ledge crops overhanging to winter. I'm like, yeah, no, I don't think so. I live right here. I'm not hanging out on those ledge crops, <laughs> ledges in the winter, I, they're, they're at least as smart as you and me. So um, we explored it, T tie up, why would they call it tie up? And somebody said to me, I think they tied their ponies up. I go, no, we didn't have ponies. We weren't riding horses at that time. Um, and nobody was tying Indians up. They would have been killing them if anything. And, and I just, the only thing I could think of was hanging game. So as we hiked up it, like, yeah, so you go up and kill a moose, are you gonna drag it up this thing to get up to <laughs> these cliffs? And, um, whoops, wait a minute, picture of us in there and try to hang it off. I mean, I can't even tell you how high up the top of this ledge is. Now that, that didn't make any sense either. Then I, I realized like I had gone through all the town histories, thank God they're online now, so we can just zoom through them and, um, so in researching, you know, you're looking at the local records, again, trying to figure out what tie-up is. And so in the local history for Henniker, both Henniker and Bradford strongly identify with this place and know it by that name. So here I find um, some, a lot of the uh, writing Indians out of history stuff that we have come to learn and expect to see and try to see through. But if you notice here, they're talking about the warriors who were doing the raids on the towns, the lower settlements. But what was happening in Brad in Henniker? Oh, the early settlers often giving them food and harboring them in their dwellings at night so that the Abenaki said no white man should have harm in number six because they're treating him kindly. And then you get the disappearing soon. They were all gone. There's some other important parts in that too, but, um, just to move along in a speedy fashion. And then in the Bradford history, uh, here you see a picture of some, some uh, folks in the early 1900s taking a hike up to recreate there. And so again, just a well-known site there. So this map is important. The Indian trails map, Chester Price did. It shows the various trails in New Hampshire if you he was an archaeologist, a state archaeologist. If you lay a, a road map today over it, it's much the same roads. If we zoom into the section that go the right way, that um, where we're working, that triangle I told you about. So here we are, the Kentucky River, which is the Kentucky Trail over to Hopkinton, the Warner River or the Sunipi Sunipi Trail. It goes up to Lake Sunapee region and then down to the Mananoc region. But uh, so we're here in Hanukkah and where the Indian tie up is, is right here. I live right here. Um, there is a class six road and the first settler who left Hanukkah to settle Bradford in 1795, Bradford was settled really late um, followed the wilderness trail, the history said. So we know that's the Indian trail and we know it's been, kept in mind historically, the historical societies agree, it was Liberty Hill Road in Henniker that became Roe Mountain Road in Bradford. And Henniker part is a class six road in Bradford, it's not a class six road or part of it is not. At any rate, this, this is about a mile off the road, the, uh, yeah, the path. So that became kind of important. You also see this is a village, Massasecum. So we have some other confirmations going on. There's some other cool stuff about this map, but let me keep on time here. Mm -hmm. uh, the captive story. So in Elizabeth Hansen's captive story over on the seacoast, see here, thus we went through several swamps and some brooks. They carefully avoiding all paths in any track like a road 
so that their footsteps wouldn't be followed. And another one, it said specifically, they stayed about a mile off the pathway. So I'm like, okay, this thing's about a mile off the pathway. Uh, Hanukkah's aiding and abetting the enemy in the warfare. Um, yeah, something's going on here. I'm really starting to, they're tying up captives. That's who got tied up. Indians didn't get tied up. They got killed. Captives got tied up. Then a woman got a hold of me and said she wanted to, um, I honestly, God love her. I don't remember her name or why she wanted to talk to me, but thank God she told me. And if you're on, put your name in the chat. I'm so sorry. Uh, but Lorraine Carroll was who she talked about, who had written this book called <laughs> Rhetorical Drag, Gender Impersonation in the Captivity Stories um, and the Writing of History. And so that's all about how men were stealing women's voices. And these captive stories became a genre of literature. So trying to like get through them to scrape off the colonial veneer and, and find clues for us about our history is challenging. And I expected, so this woman was very gracious and she said, yeah, I'll set something up with Loran for you. And she did. And I, and I told Loran this, I expected like I was gonna get this older scholar in or professor from Maine who, um, anyway, it, Loran was not what I expected at all. She listened very intently and after I talked about my theory about the site, she said to me, you need to look at Elizabeth Hansen's captive story. I said, yeah, I did. And she said, let me ask you this. Were there any Quakers in the early settlers in Hanukkah? And I go, yeah, yeah, there were. Yeah, and we're still working with, the, with them. Uh, they're still there today, Quakers, people and descendants of those people. So Loram was explaining that Quakers have a whole different viewpoint in her extensive studies of all the different uh, captive stories, even given this rhetoric, even that though men are really pretending to talk in a woman's voice, it still became clear that in the Quaker communities, there was a very different attitude toward Abenaki people than there were in the, Eng in the English communities. So, <clears throat> and I may be saying that wrong because I'm not saying Quakers aren't English or whatever, but at any rate, it mattered. And, um, and so lo and behold, um, there we have it, that Hanukkah's early settlers were Quakers. And so our working theory out of all of that uh, do -do 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 is given that Hanukkah was a frontier town and the settlers were aiding and abetting the warriors on their raids and given the captive stories of traveling off the trails or roads and given the Quakers favorable relate or more favorable relation with the Abenaki and given the site was well known in both Hanukkah and Bradford as Indian tie up, we believe the site was used as a captive rendezvous site. And we do plan, um, Dr. Goodby is more than happy. We, we're negotiating with the landowner. We do plan on doing a dig it would not be a sensitive site for us. Uh, but if we find colonial shoe buckles, buttons, the kinds of things that um, colonials might have dropped as they were being assembled there to then be uh, divided up and taken off to Canada to be redeemed or adopted. Um, so we're pretty excited about, about that. Okay, so questions. We're at the question part. And I just wanted to say if uh, quickly that if people want more information, you can, uh, our primary place, whoops, I apologize, Prezi and my cook, is our Facebook page. And if you just go to Facebook, if you're on Facebook and you search for Abenaki Trails, you'll find all kinds of posts about all these things. Uh, the email address on the Facebook page is not the best way to contact us. You probably won't hear back quickly. We're working on that. But messaging us on Facebook works really great. We do have a website. It's just a general overview. Um, I created it and I'm honestly not keeping it up. We have some young people working on that. The Charitable Foundation has funded a project for our youth to work on our online presence. Uh, but the one thing on there that's really good is the contact. That email comes directly to us and you'll get an answer quickly. Clio, I want to talk about today. It's a mapping program. You can go to theclio.com. You can look for tour number 2059, Abenaki Trails. It hasn't been as successful as I thought it was gonna be at the time we wrote the description for this. Um, I can show you really quickly before we start with the questions that when you get in there, there's a map 
uh, component that's like uses Google Maps. So this is a really good urban fit. Like if you're in a city, it'll go right down to the street level, right? And see things. But out where we are, where, you know, where you're going to find Native American sites is where there hasn't been development happening, right? So that's not where Google Maps is focusing in. So you, we, we do the GPS markers. We can get a general location. We can put in some information. I think there's still more possibility for it. And, and if somebody just wants to go check out these sites I've talked about, they are located in there. You can look. The descriptions uh, aren't the best uh, yet, but at any rate, it is what it is. Okay, thank you, Sherry. There's so much information to digest. So um, it's great that we're recording and people can go back and kind of zoom in and watch some of this. Um, so there are a few questions and everyone else, um, if you've been waiting to ask your questions, now is the time. So please put them in the chat, but I, there's been a few that I can relay that have already come in. Um, Elizabeth would like to know um, if there's a way to volunteer with the Tra Abenaki Trails project and if there's information online about that or what's the best way to connect with you around that. Thank you. And I should say that um, it, this isn't a trail as in a lot of us think about, like you don't drive somewhere and start and then walk through. Um, it's more, it could be a driving tour. It, it, it could be that. Anyway, so the typical kinds of volunteer things like trail marking and clearing um, are not as big. We do have needs. Are we organized enough to be able to know how to do that and, and direct people? Not totally, a little bit. Uh, our youth are taking on this whole online piece. That's important. We will have some needs for um, assistance if we get this grant and we start working on the, uh, the project um, at the Bradford Springs with, with that walkway. The best thing is to watch our Facebook page and to ask on there. And um, so... We've had, you know, and or just if you know you have some great skill and you look at what we're doing and you think, wow, I think this might help, feel free to offer it. And then, you know, we'll let you know if how to plug that in. A lot of this stuff has happened, not because we're brilliant or we're great at coordinating things, but just because I guess it was meant to and people offered and it all fit in. I'm good at fitting things in. There's another um, related question about whether you're partnering with the Sierra Club at all in any of this? No, they haven't um, come on board. I don't know if they have properties in this, in the area we've worked in. So um, that's a good question. I mean, it just, it hasn't come up. So the answer is not yet. <laughs> um, let's see, there was one that came in early about in the, when you were talking about the dugout canoe and you were showing a neighbor who had two artifacts and, um, one was an arrowhead and they're wondering what was the other, what was the other thing he was holding? Okay, great. Yeah, that was a spear point. And um, the other thing is a fish weight. So for, for nets. So uh, we would use those stones and tie them to nets. And so when you threw the net, it would, um, it would weigh it down. Aha. Um. So here's a question from Debbie. You talked a little bit about this plan, especially for the Bradford Springs sites to put in markers. She's wondering if they're all, have historical been markers been placed there or in any other places yet to raise awareness about these sites and this history? So um, no markers have been put anywhere yet. We, you know, we started, it hasn't been two years yet. Um, last year, remember it rained all summer. So that kind of washed out a lot of our going outside treks. Um, but there was so all of this negotiation around uh, getting agreements and, and, and we really want to secure the Abenaki's ability to gather on these sites and that gets into legal, you know, so there just has been all this negotiation going on and all in a good way. It's all come out to a good way. <clears throat> and it's really important that uh, conservation people understand that before you write your conservation easement, reach out to the tribes, because uh, if we can include that, and we have some groups that are doing that with us now, there's a public group with two private landowners that are including us before uh, they go to Five Rivers. But um, so 
there's, there's plans in place for markers in several places, but I think Bradford Springs is gonna wind up being the first place to actually get the markers in place. I have a, a follow-up question that's related to that when you're talking about easements and being sure to consult the tribes, like what are the things that, that landowners and land trusts should be considering um, in you know, reaching out, but then what are, what are your needs and concerns around these easements and, and with access for the Abenaki community? So um, we're very fortunate. I, I mentioned we're a family band and we've been doing things, we've lived here for hundreds of years and we've been doing things for, you know, whatever, decades right here locally. But 10 years ago, when the Vermont offered a path of recognition, four tribes in Vermont uh, were able to achieve state recognition status. So uh, this is a whole nother talk. Indian affairs can get really complicated. But once there was a state recognized Abenaki tribe, that had an impact on those. So as a basket maker, when the federal government and the state governments did not recognize the Abenaki, I could make Abenaki baskets all day long and not break the law. I couldn't make Indian made baskets. I would have broken the law if I said they were Indian made, but I could say they were Abenaki and, and I don't believe that the BIA could have come after me. But as soon as it was a recognized tribe, now it would be illegal for me to say I make Abenaki baskets. So we have these complications we live with that um, people tend not to understand. At any rate, our family band, uh, recognized our kin in the Nelhegan band, and we uh, all became Nelhegan, not all of us, but most of us are Nelhegan citizens now. And um, so fortunately for us, we have an incredible amount of uh, information and knowledge available to us now. And Chief Don Stevens of the Nelhegan band has been doing this in Vermont for the last decade. He's worked out these agreements with groups and on our website, um, which I forgot to put that, if you go to um, abenakitribe.org, that's the Nalhegan website. And uh, on our website, there's all these agreements that Don has worked out with various public, fe both federal, state, and private landowners. And, um, and I've developed a plant list for us to use in New Hampshire with our Abenaki name, Latin name, plant name, what the use is. So that's really a really strong function of this is that it gives us, so historically we didn't, we weren't about owning land, we were about using the land. And our understanding when settlers came and wanted access to land was we were sharing the use of the land. It wasn't like that. And <laughs> we learned that that wasn't what was happening, but uh, we're asking now that, that, that we go back to that. And that at least in these public lands, but even in private lands. Um, so it's it's access to gather plants, medicines, and we have the plant list done and the times we would gather and uh, the amounts per person. And then we're negotiating now and finalizing it. And Vermont has already established this, um, how, how the landowner is assured uh, that it's an Abenaki person asking for access so much for that explanation. Good um, question. Luann is wondering if she, where, um, where you have your basket making classes and, and <laughs> are they, I don't know if Luann's a member of the Abenaki community, if they're limited to the Abenaki community to sharing traditions in, in that way, or if you could just talk about that. Okay, so we don't have um, regular classes. Bill and I take on, uh, both Bill and I take on apprentices and, um, and that's through the New Hampshire Council on the Arts and the Vermont Folklife Center. And um, we, we both have waiting lists right now, but not super long waiting lists. So for the fancy basket making that I do, that is restricted to Abenaki only. And that was a condition when um, Sophie Nolette taught Jeannie Brink, uh, Jeannie had to agree that she would only teach other Abenaki. And so Jeannie asked the same of, her apprentices, I learned from Jeannie, and I asked the same of those I teach, the fancy basket making. Then Bill and I both worked with Newt Washburn, that's a utilitarian style of Abenaki basket making, and we had no such restriction. So the answer is we can teach utilitarian basket making, 
uh, to non-Abenaki people. And I, Bill's talking to, is it Sanborn Mills, Bill? Anyway, uh, watch, our, watch our Facebook page. There may be a class, some classes coming up. Bill may do one there. Um, and we're really hoping our apprentices, we've been teaching people will get going and start offering more, more opportunities for people to learn too. Wonderful, thank you. There are a few more questions, but I know you wanted a couple of minutes at the end. We're nearing the end of our time and you wanted a few minutes to mention some upcoming events. So I wanna make sure that we leave time for that. So do you wanna, can you wanna, you wanna talk about what's coming up? Sure, I'll talk about that really quickly. And then, and then I don't mind staying a little later if other people don't mind to um, answer a couple more questions. Okay. Events. So we just, I just wanted to share a few things on February 26th and 27th, we're doing a snow snake game at Mount Kearsage Indian Museum. And you can um, Google that and you, there's YouTube videos. Um, our Nulhegan website talks about it. And uh, at MKIM, there's gonna be information uh, available too. I think there already is. So it's a fun outdoor game. You can bring the kids. Um, that's the 26th, 27th of this month. We're hoping we have snow, pray for snow for us. <laughs> and um, the Fells in Newbury is doing an Abenaki art show this summer, beautiful place. And Holderness on June 4th, we're gonna be doing a reunion event. We did something about a decade ago with Holderness and Dan Shears, our um, tribal cultural res uh, resources expert. He doesn't like when I say that, advisor <laughs> is um, gonna be doing a dugout canoe demonstration and they have their dugout canoe that came out of the Squam Lake that was just returned to them. So that's pretty exciting. There'll be other arts and crafts for sale and um, things happening at that. Hills History Live is the third weekend. I hope I'm saying this right, Marion. The third weekend in August. And if I said that wrong, Marion will type it in the chat. And um, then the Huffington Historical Society is doing a summer long exhibit called on Abenaki Foodways. And in October, watch for the date uh, the, on their website or our Facebook page. We'll, we're working together to do um, a harvest dinner with this whole, we have this whole big um, food security program and organic farmers are growing our seeds and all that kind of stuff, cool stuff. So that's it for, for events. And if anybody had any more questions, I'm happy to take them. I, 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 we, we can stay, I think, a few extra minutes for the few folks whose questions weren't answered. But before we do that, and before anyone else might hop off, I, I want to thank you so much for being here. And I know if we were in the room, everyone would be standing up and clapping. And we're on Zoom, so we're all doing that in our living rooms. But um, Sherry, thank you so much for sharing this project. It's really exciting to see um, all the plans that are underway. And I know those of us in the Monadnock region are really excited about the prospect down the road of, of bringing bringing this work closer to where we are too. So um, there's lots of thank yous in the chat. I, so I, um, for those of you who wanna stay just a couple extra minutes, I'll ask a few, there was just two or three questions that came in we didn't have time for. One was a question from someone in New York asking if there were stone structures near any of these sites that you found. So there are, and um, uh, I, I neglected to mention that, in fact, I know that there's a meeting set up with the Harris Center and I think the Monadnock Conservation Group and, and my husband, Bill, and Chief Roger Longto from the Elnu Band and Chief Paul Bunnell. Uh, anyway, so that talk is gonna be happening soon. And Chief Roger um, Longto Sheehan is really has incredible knowledge about stone structures. And so we're really looking, we're really excited and looking forward to um, having Roger be able to tour some of those sites with us and, and really start to dig in and get a handle because, you know, we all have been told, Bill and I own 220 acres here in Warner and we have piles of stone all over the place that supposedly, you know, we've all grown up being told they were farmers piling rocks. Ours are not in places where farmers would have piled rocks. It doesn't make sense. So we're now learning that there are um, Karens that were Abenaki and yeah. So we're, that's something we're just starting to explore for this area. 
Um, Dr. Goodby obviously does know quite a bit about um, the possibilities, but he really leans on us for knowledge. And he and Roger have been starting that conversation about working together and, and looking at specifically the Monadnock region together. Wonderful, that's exciting. Um, there is a question about ash and the ash borer mm -hmm. and um, how you're adapting to that um, and where you're harvesting ash and what your thoughts are. On so right after that reveal and I, we wiped our tears the next day I got on the phone to the state and was very excited to learn that the state of New Hampshire had <clears throat> um, start, started a project. We have one forest health person, David, uh, William Davidson, who's housed at Fox Forest in Hillsborough. And uh, I spoke with him. And so they, they, the state has picked one site in each county. Is that right, Bill? Anyway, there's several sites around the state and, um, and they are inoculating the trees in the hope that that will save enough of a population that eventually as this thing uh, starves itself to death or gets poisoned by. Um, so I have an organic farm. I have 220 acres. I won't even let people wear bug spray to come here. Like I'm really hardcore. And guess what? I, my trees, there were 10 trees here. You have to have 10. He has criteria. We met the criteria. He came out and did a tour and he inoculated 10 of our trees. And then there's a lot of other sites all around the state that the same is happening. So that's one measure. Um, in the meantime, that's another piece we're working with. In the southern part of the state, it, it's almost too late. There's hardly, you're very hard pressed to find a black ash or brown ash that's salvageable at this point. But um, uh, we're working with foresters and, and landowners further north. And that's one of the part of the conversation Bill will be having with you all is, you know, if we can find, if we can be talking together, we can be harvesting them before they're gone. We might as well do that. And, then, and so right now our tribe is working with um, the Nalhegan, some federal land. And uh, we're planning a really, the guys are planning a really big, and girls, ladies are planning a big event um, up in the Nalhegan to, so that they're gonna be harvesting some ash for us and um, allowing us to do a pounding event. Once we pound it, we can store it forever. It'll last a really, really long time. Uh, but if we leave it standing, the bugs will kill it and it will be gone and nobody gets any good from it except, I guess, the woodpeckers. Wow. Thank you for that. Um, so there, there's a couple of questions I think will be our last ones that are related to each other and they're um, about surface artifacts and kind of what whether you have found any, your group in your work, and someone else is wondering, um, you know, if you find them, if, so, if I were to find one on Lake Nubanusit somewhere, you know, what should we do with them? It, I'm, I'm assuming it's illegal to keep them. Um, and is there a way to return them to Abenaki communities? Is there a place at the state for them? So um, you have a really good question. I don't have one pat answer to give people. Um, I will give you what I know to be true, but I'm not a lawyer. So uh, I suppose an environmental law person can best answer, but to the best of my understanding, there is no law against what you find on the ground, you, you um, finders keepers, or uh, actually it's the landowner um, that would own them if you find something on the ground. The, uh, interestingly enough, we just learned this, there's a dig happening, or there was last summer, and I think it's gonna continue at, um, in Washington at Pillsbury State Park. And what we learned at that, the state archeologist was explaining what, if it's in the water, the state owns it. So- uh, Right, because the state it, owns <laughs> bodies of water over a certain size, right? Yep, so if it's in a river or a lake, the state owns it. If it's on private land, the landowner owns it. Uh, from the tribal perspective, we feel, so talking about the um, dugout canoe, in Squam Lake, that had been donated to Shelburne Museum back in the 1940s or something. And uh, long story short, it just came back. And 
the tribes were consulted, the four recognized, state recognized Abenaki tribes were consulted about it. And they all told Shelburne Museum that um, they were all in agreement that we believe the artifacts belong where they were found or closest to where they were found. And in this case, uh, we all supported it going back to the Holderness Historical Society and for them to work on the preservation um, means. You know, in terms of digging stuff up, that's a big no-no on all accounts. You know, the, the, the archeologists get very upset about it because, and they even get upset about losing it off the surface. So the, the issue around that is in order for us to know these things we've been talking about today, we have to know what's there and what's been found. So to the extent the historical societies, and they do have the artifacts and they know where they came from, then, um, then that helps put the pieces of the puzzle together to know the history that, because our history wasn't written. So these parts and pieces help tell the history. And then there's the whole issue of burials, that when our people were buried, items would get buried with them. And so that becomes very sensitive information. And, um, you know, so for the most part, Abenaki people feel like if there's something buried in the ground, it belongs there, leave it alone and don't, don't dig it up, don't take it away. With archaeology, all of the tribes we're seeing and our tribe is grappling with this and we don't have a definitive answer yet on it, but um, we've agreed on that one at Indian tie up that that would make sense to work with, um, you know, with Dr. Goodby and see about buttons and buckles and colonial things that would not be a site our people would have hung out at or done anything uh, ceremonial or anything like that. So, um, but as a rule, tribes are looking more and more at working with archeologists and learning more and more about their history. It's a changing field. I don't think there's an easy answer. And, uh, and I would not be the person to speak for our tribe about definitive answers for that. Right. I hope that's clear as mud. It's kind of <laughs> it's complex, you know, yeah. that's the nature of it. Yep. So yeah. thank you again so much, Sherry. And thanks all of you for joining us tonight. Um, there was a question, will there be another event like this in the future? I can say, I hope so. Um, we don't know yet, but um, we're hoping for kind of ongoing learning and um, communications and sharing and, and working together. So um, we do hope so. February 23rd, uh, there's going to be The Firstings and Lastings by Jeannie O'Brien is an incredible book that talks about how our people were written out of history in the history books. And she was studying New England histories when she wrote that book. She's lecturing February 23rd. Google it. It's a virtual lecture. I think you all would enjoy it. What's her name? Jeannie O'Brien, and her book is Firsting and Lastings. She's a professor out of Mi Michigan, I believe. I should know what um, college she's at, and I apologize. I'm, I don't have that off the top thank of my you. head. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and um, have a good night, and enjoy the snow snakes next weekend, Sherry. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs>